welcome back to the TMBC Wake YouTube channel. If you enjoy this video, please click the like button. Also, please leave comments. I enjoy hearing your feedback. And make sure to subscribe if you haven't already, as well as click the notification bell so you can be notified of my future videos. First of all, I want to say if you have not watched my surfboard giveaway video, make sure to get over to that video and watch it so you can enter to win a surfboard. I mean, who doesn't want a free surfboard? I'm going to put a link in the description below for that video. Um, so if you haven't watched it, get over there and watch it. We have quite a ways to go to get to a thousand subscribers. So if you have entered the drawing, make sure that you continue sharing maybe once a week or in a, on a different platform and that'll help the subscriber number get up to a thousand so I can draw a winner. Okay, it's 2019. I've only snow plowed one more time. We've only gotten snow a couple of times, um, a lot less than last year. Uh, so it's good and bad, I guess. Uh, it's been fairly nice weather for January. I'm just getting more excited for the wakeboarding season to get here. I've been playing with my GoPro 7. I did a little time warp. Um, it's a very cool feature on the GoPro 7. I'll just share that with you. Basically, we were walking on what's called the rims in Billings. It's basically a cliff that goes along the side of Billings. I wish the lighting would have been a lot better, uh, but I just wanted to play with it, get used to it, get ready for the things I'm really going to be using it for. Okay, so now to talk about the subject of this video. I believe that in order to understand what motivates a person to do the things they do, you need to understand or learn some of the backstory of a person's life. Based on that principle, I decided I'm going to share some information about my life with you. When I was 14, uh, just entering my freshman year of high school, I was diagnosed with cancer in my left knee. I'm going to try to give you the highlights of that experience and then tell you how that affected my life at the time, up until now, and going forward. After I was diagnosed with cancer, my mom and I went to Seattle, Seattle Children's Hospital to be exact, and got a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. And then my mom and I spent most of the next year in Seattle so I could receive treatment. That treatment consisted of chemotherapy. Um, I couldn't receive radiation because the tumor or cancer that I had uh, was hard tissue. It was the outer layer of bone, not the bone marrow. And with hard tissue, at least at the time, uh, radiation had no effect on hard tissue tumors. So the chemotherapy protocol that was prescribed to me was a very heavy dose of chemotherapy and consisted of 12 separate rounds of the chemotherapy giving me time to rest in between. And also in the middle of that, uh, they would remove the tumor and replace it. The tumor was on the end of my femur. So what I would do is I would go in for about two or three days of chemotherapy. And then after that, I would go back to the Ronald McDonald house, stay nearby because the chemotherapy I was receiving would completely destroy my blood counts as well as destroying the, the cancer. And typically I would get my blood drawn on a daily basis and about a week or so later I would end up with some sort of infection or sickness uh, because I had no blood counts, no uh, white blood counts, no, no red blood counts. A lot of times you'd have no platelets. Um, so you were basically at high risk for bleeding, infection, 
all those different things. Um, then I would go into the hospital, get treated for that infection, uh, hope, hoping that they can uh, uh, bring me back. And usually, and, and, and in my case, I did come back uh, every time. And once my blood counts were back up, then we'd go back in and do another treatment. I would go back in for two or three more days of chemotherapy and then just com continue that cycle. Um, so the initial protocol was for 12 months of that. Um, after four cycles of that, then I would have surgery on my knee. And the surgery was to remove the bottom of my femur, which included the tumor and, and extra, so that they made sure that they got it all out. And then also the top of my tibia so that they could install the replacement. I've got some, some x-rays to show you of what my replacement looks like. All right, so here are some x-rays of my metal knee. So on the bottom left, you can see a side view of my left knee. You can see that this x-ray was taken in 2002. The knee connection to the tibia rod is actually a, a hinge. There's a pin there. You can see a rod going into my tibia. A Teflon cushion is, you can't actually see. There should be another Teflon cushion um, right, where the, right where the connection from my femur to the knee, knee replacement is. Um, and that's my kneecap on the right. And the kneecap is still bone. So here's the rod in my femur. And the rest of that is metal in between. Here's a better shot of my femur. This is a front view. You can see uh, the connection in the knee. Um, there's the rod going up into my femur, and you can see it goes quite far up into my femur. And you can also see about how much they cut off. It's like six inches or so of my femur that they cut off. And there's a pin, but you can't really see it in here. Um, you can see the connection to the tibia there, and basically there's a middle piece that goes up in, tween, in between the, the femur end, and then it, it's, it's held in there with a pin that goes across. And here's a front view of my whole knee. Um, there I'm pointing to the Teflon cushion there that looks invisible. And then there's the, the tibia rod again. There's the connection in between, and there's the pin. You can see the end of the pin there. It's kind of like a screw head. And there's my kneecap I just showed you. So it's a total knee replacement, which differs from a normal knee replacement because typically in a normal knee replacement, they only replace the knuckles on your, on your knee. Um, in this case, they re replaced my entire knee. So now I'm going to show you the scar uh, where they had to cut to, to do the knee replacement. So this is my left leg and the scar goes from just below my knee all the way up to about oh top 20% of my thigh. Um, and now I'm showing you a comparison between my left leg and my right leg. You can see that my right quad is quite a bit bigger. And they actually had to cut out about half or more of my quad. Um, so that never really built back. My left leg will never be as strong as my right leg, although I do work out and try to equalize them as much as possible. So that's actually the first replacement. I'm on my second replacement and on the second replacement they just left the rod in both the femur and the tibia. They cut it off right right above the uh, where the rod comes out of the tibia and right below where the rod comes out of the femur uh, and then they just welded in a new knee piece. So the recovery time for the first knee replacement was uh, six weeks of not standing on it at all and then after that I had to do a lot of physical therapy and then and then I could walk on it the uh, the second knee replacement I could walk on it the next day it took a little while before I could walk on it normally uh, the last replacement I had was back in 2003 the first replacement I had was in January 1997 after I got my knee replacement and before I could even stand on my knee I went back for more chemotherapy um, by the time I got through my 10th round of chemotherapy, um, it was determined that because when they took, out, took my tumor out, they tested it uh, and it was 100% dead and basically the subsequent cycles of chemotherapy were for uh, making sure there was no other trace of it in my body. Um, but after the 10th cycle, 
uh, my counts weren't coming up very well. So they decided to end it and we skipped my last two cycles. Um, that year of my life, I basically, I basically did not get to participate in normal high school activities for my freshman year. I did, uh, I did have a tutor from the hospital and I did complete four credits, which normally you do six or so credits, six to seven credits in a normal year and, and at, in my high school at the time. Um, so it, it definitely um, was a, an interesting year. Uh, I, I was in a lot of pain. I was very sick uh, throughout that year, um, mostly because of the chemotherapy. Um, and the surgery, uh, but in the end, uh, my protocol had a, about a 70% survival rate and I did fantastic. Um, there were uh, a handful of other kids that I knew at the time that had the same cancer uh, and that were going in to be treated. Some were staying right there uh, with me. So, you know, we kind of all had our own results um, and mine were, mine along with a couple of others were some of the best. The good news about those others is that even though their results weren't as good as mine as far as how much the tumor was uh, killed with the chemo, uh, they're still alive today. So uh, the type of cancer I had was it had a very high survival rate, it's just a very rough treatment. All that being said, you may wonder, what am I doing wakeboarding? And that would be a good question. I really shouldn't be wakeboarding. Uh, but you have to understand, I was a very athletic person before I was diagnosed with cancer. I had played basketball, uh, I did track, I did wrestling, all those things in junior high. Um, and I had planned on wrestling and doing track in high school. You give a now 15 year old kid a metal knee and he's a very active kid. Uh, and you tell him all he can do is walk on his leg. Um, it's hard to sell, uh, and my parents would be able to tell you that. Basically in high school, I felt as though I was being held back from doing what I wanted to do. I finally convinced my parents to let me try snowboarding. Um, and the way I convinced them of that is that my, my legs would be working together as opposed to skiing or another sport where your legs are working independently. Um, so that way my good leg would be able to compensate for my bad leg. They okayed it and I went and tried it out. I don't think they thought it was gonna be as much of a thing as it ended up being. I ended up uh, spending pretty much my entire junior winter and my entire senior winter at the mountain uh, snowboarding and I loved it and I was actually decent at it. Um, but my leg always held me back from trying big tricks, um, you know, flips and spins. I, I, I never, I've never done a 360 or any flips on a, a snowboard because I didn't want to break my leg because if I break my metal knee, chances are it will break out of the bone and then it might not be replaceable again. So I've always been cautious of that. So fast forward a little bit. Uh, to uh, my mid-20s and I start getting into water sports. Um, I get my first taste of wakeboarding and I start to fall in love with it because the thing about water is although you can get pretty hurt wakeboarding, uh, if you do it in a controlled manner then you can try flips, twists, whatever you want, you're not likely to break limbs. Um, strain joints, tear joints, uh, yes, but breaking something is not as common. Um, I, I've heard of break, broken ribs, I feel like I've almost broken my ribs a few times, um, but it's just not as common. So I feel like I can do more and therefore I have done more. So that's a little bit about me and wakeboarding. Um, I've said this before, um, I'm going to say it again, I learned almost all the tricks I know now with wakeboarding in my 30s. I'm about to turn 37 um, and I plan on continuing to learn new tricks. So after sharing some of my life with you, what I want to say is don't let excuses get in your way. If there's something out there that you want, you should be making excuses to achieve that as opposed to making excuses so that you can't achieve that. 
my example is how I told my parents that I would be fine on the snowboard because my legs work together as opposed to individually. Um, I was making an excuse so that I could go and give it a try. So I don't want to go any deeper because I, I don't want to drag on forever. I could talk about this subject for a while as it's a big part of my life. I do want to say that having cancer was a very rough time in my life, but it also is what has driven me to achieve certain goals in life. Um, goals that I may not have made had I not had that near death sort of experience. If you want to hear more about this subject, make sure to comment below. If you have questions for me, you can leave comments. Uh, I'm very, I'm very responsive to comments. If you want to see some good videos of Wakely, she's been jabbering quite a bit lately, so stick around. Also, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like it. If you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, make sure to subscribe. Otherwise, we'll see you next time. Hi. What do you think? Yeah. My goodness. Use your little, use your little voice. Huh? Hello? <laughs> Say hello. Whoa. You're so silent. You're not very calm. <laughs> You're so funny. Oh. oh. You like to talk. <laughs> what do you got to say? Oh.